Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about nerve block complications. Um, and as you guys know, we are doing a lot of nerve blocks in the emergency department. So these are just a few of the nerve block articles or the nerve block studies that have been done. So we have transgluteal, we have supraclavicular, we have interscalene, we have uh, forearm blocks, we have retroclavicular approach to an infraclavicular brachial plexus block. We have the raptor block. We have saphenous and sciatic nerve blocks. We have a pericapsular nerve block for hip fracture, the pain block. Um, and then we also have the, um, uh, we can do femoral nerve blocks in a bunch of different ways. And it's safe and there are no problems and it's better than using a bunch of opioids. And all of that is true. Um, and the American College of Emergency Physicians has uh, come out with a policy statement two years ago almost that ultrasound guided nerve blocks are not only within the scope of practice of emergency physicians, but represent a core component of a multimodal pathway to control pain for patients in the ED. So we're doing all these blocks and you block a patient and uh, reduce a, a shoulder, nice interscaling block, and he happens to be a pitcher for the guardians. And he's back a couple of weeks later, actually with his daughter as a patient, and he says, Doc, my hand is still numb. Uh, you know, how long is this going to last? Is it permanent? You know, I'm a, I'm a pitcher, and if this is permanent, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Uh-oh. Or... The trauma folks tell you, hey, you know that guy you blocked for his nasty humerus fracture and eventually he went to surgery? We cannot get him off the vent. It turns out his diaphragm is paralyzed. Did we do that? Maybe. And uh, hopefully this will never happen to you. Remember that rib fracture patient you signed out yesterday? The guy you had blocked using that serratus anterior block and then he was fine, except like after an hour, he started to decompensate and he went into cardiac arrest. Oops. And, you know, do people want to sue us for complications of nerve blocks? Yes, they do. Alleged error with nerve block leads to medical malpractice claim. Anesthesia nerve blocks, what are they and how they cause medical malpractice? So this is, um, these are just looking up ads on the internet for nerve block lawsuits. And this one says nerve blocks can cause permanent injury with just a simple injection. And then here's one they, uh, with a diaphragm um, uh, paralyzation, the phrenic nerve palsy, patient is left with lifelong breathing problem. And here in the state of Ohio, a patient receives half a million dollars after a botched peripheral nerve block. So let's talk about some peripheral nerve block complications. So we're gonna talk about the mechanisms of injury, some strategies to minimize the injuries. And then we're also gonna talk about LAST, local anesthetic systemic toxicity, um, how to recognize it and how to treat it and how to prevent it. So nerve block complications, they are pretty rare, long-term and permanent. Short-term though, lasting you know, more than 48 hours, but less than several months, it's as high as 10 to 15%. And we don't really have good information on it because there's not really an, been efforts to collect data on this, right? Nobody is following the patients to to um, regularly all these patients who get blocked to see if they have lasting um, effects of the block. So there's some effort to do that now in the anesthesia world. Um, and, and so this data is based on what uh, we have available. And you know it ranges from loss of sensation, loss of motor control, um, think diaphragm specifically, and then chronic pain. So let's talk a little bit about the peripheral nerve anatomy. So the nerve is surrounded by this epineuron, epineurium. And there's, there's also intrafascicular epineurium. And this stuff is kind of fat tissue, collagen, connective tissue. 
and it's usually pretty loose. Um, so, so that's kind of a protective measure for the, the fascicles. And there's blood vessels in there supplying the fascicles of the nerves. And then you actually have the fascicular bundle. So that's where the, um, the nerves are actually like the axon of the nerves are in these uh, fascicles. So you have, you know, the axon is there and you have the myelinated fiber and then um, very, very inside is the unmyelinated ax, uh, axon. Um, and there's endoneurium within the fascicle and there's perineurium outside of the fascicle surrounding it. So the epineurium, epineurium is actually pretty, um, pretty easy to penetrate because it's loose tissue. It doesn't have a really thick um, collagen boundary. The perineurium is actually much tougher to penetrate. So you can actually have interneuronal injections that don't penetrate a fascicle um, and that's less damaging. So the types of injury, mechanical pressure, I, mechanical and pressure, I kind of lump these two together. So these would be actually injuring the nerve or um, so sticking it with a needle or injecting something and the, the pressure of the injection um, causes the damage. Chemical, infectious, ischemic and vascular, and also inflammatory, which is a mechanism of injury that they're really just starting to explore. And you can actually classify this stuff. So the most common classification is the sedon um, classification. And there's neuropraxy, axonomesis, and neuro, neuromesis. So with neuropraxia, this is this is fairly minor damage and it's often caused by compressing or stretching the nerve. And you just wind up with, with uh, the conduction slows um, and there's some blocking. And usually the prognosis for this is really good. And the nice thing about what we're doing about nerve blocks is that most of the damage falls into this category. So when there are complications, um, the, they almost always involve, you know, stretching of the nerve or the fascicles, but not actual disruption of the axon, um, which the next category does. So you have, so you actually have some disruption of the axon um, within the nerve, um, and but the endoneurium is intact. So you just kind of somehow manage to sever the axon or or, um, or uh, stretch it way out, and it's it's um, come apart. Um, and then the last category under the set on classification, you're basically kind of like, you know, severed the nerve there um, because everything, the endoneurium is also um, disrupted, although you can still have an intact uh, uh, perineurium. Um, and so, and then there's this other classification that goes into um, loss of you know, basically you severed even the, the perineural continuity between, um, you know, the fascicle, you've actually just broken the fascicle. And then of course, if you completely transect the nerve, but most of the damage done, uh, most of the complications with peripheral nerve blocks is actually in the neuropraxia um, category. So mechanical or pressure injection. So this typically happens when you stick the needle into the fast, into the nerve itself. So this is just showing you um, the C5, C6 root, and then the C7 root is, um, so you can actually see the fascicles in there. And remember that that, that perineurium around the fascicles um, is actually, um, you know, it's not likely to cause so much damage if you stick the needle in there. And this is just a micron, um, a microscope showing you the structure here and showing you a um, nice small gauge needle actually embedded in the neuron. And you can see that it's actually, it's, it's in that epineurum. It's not um, actually within the fascicle, at least I, I can't tell that it is. So it's dug in there, um, but it's kind of pushed the fascicle away from it. So that's actually good. So they found interestingly that if you stick um, the, the needle into the perineurium, 
And sometimes even if you inject into the perineurium, it does not cause damage because the fascicles move away um, and, and they, don't, they don't get affected. If, now, if the ratio of fascicles to perineurium is very low, then you can create some pressure problems. So if the bundle contains only a little perineurium and a lot of fascicles, which happens proximally, um, then you can have a greater chance of injury. But if you stick the needle into the fascicle, then you have a problem. Um, and it's made worse if you actually inject things because you get higher pressure and there's also some chemical injury. So how do you know if you might be injuring the nerve? So if there's like high pressure or resistance, the anesthetic just doesn't go in or the saline that you're doing your little test dose with, like it doesn't wanna go in. If the patient says, ow, 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 and you're really hurting them, um, you're probably in the nerve, so back off. Uh, and then they thought that paresthesias were an indicator. So if, if the patient experienced paresthesias, you should back off. Um, but with ultrasound, it's been shown that that is not a reliable indicator. So um, just the presence of paresthesia does not mean that you are actually causing nerve injury. So how can we minimize this? Well, we can pick a needle type that may minimize it. So blunt tip is generally thought to be safer. Um, so like a spinal tap needle or a, a blunt tap. And then there's also these epidural needles that have a little bit of a curve to them and also a very blunt tip. Um, and those are, those are less likely to cause damage. You also have to consider the needle diameter. It doesn't matter what kind of tip you have. If it's a big diameter needle, it's going to cause more damage. And that just makes intuitive sense. So the needle bevel. You can have like in A, a very long bevel. So like 14 degrees of angle, or you can have a really short bevel, which is greater degree of angle. So it's always been thought that you don't wanna use these long bevels because they're more likely to do damage. Um, and that's, that's true, they're more likely to enter the fascicle. But if you're using a short bevel needle, if you get into the fascicle, it's actually a greater injury. Um, the other is the, you know, how your needle um, gets into the nerve bundle. If it's perpendicular to it, it's going to cause more damage than if it's actually parallel to the fibers, which would be unusual when we're doing a block because we're almost showing, almost always doing them with the nerve in the short axis. Um, and, Whoops, I just went to the end of the slideshow. <laughs> so needle tip we talked about, and then maximizing your needle visibility. So using echogenic needles for blocks. So um, that helps you figure out where the exact tip is. Use the in-plane approach. So again, you can see the tip, the, the bevel angle. So it's gonna be more visible if you have a, a um, or you wanna you want have the bevel so it's either facing up or it's facing away from the ultrasound probe so that you can actually see how the bevel is and, and um, you know, exactly where the bevel is and where that tip is. Uh, larger diameter needles are more easily seen, but of course there's a trade-off because you can cause more damage with those. And you can also use hydrodissection to figure out where your needle is. But if you happen to be in the nerve, in the, in the, under the epineurium or in it, um, the ultrasound resolution is not currently adequate to differentiate if you are in the fascicle or if you are between the fascicles. So just keep that in mind. So if you see the nerves swell when you start to put in um, the anesthesia, so the nerve is actually swelling, that's probably a good indication that you're actually inside the nerve. Hopefully you're not in the fascicle and you probably want to stop doing your block. Although interestingly, there are some studies showing that um, blocks can be more effective if they're actually within the neuron, particularly the sciatic nerve. So 
they've done studies where they, they um, actually place the needle into the, the nerve and uh, inject, and you can see the nerve swell and there's fluid um, you know, along the outer part of the epineurium, and that gives you a really good block. But again, if you happen to get into the fascicle, you might be in trouble. So there's also a concept of pressure monitoring. So some folks did this test in anesthesia. They said, what if, you know, we could monitor the pressure and how do we know if we have a safe pressure when we're injecting our local anesthetic? And so they figured out that if you have a syringe and you put say 10 milliliters of air in it and you compress it various amounts, so 30% or 50%, you could actually figure out what the pressure is. And what they discovered is that if you um, can compress the, if there's less than 50% compression, then um, you are probably, you probably have too, uh, too, much, um, too much pressure, right? If it doesn't compress, but if it compresses to 50%, um, then you're probably okay to go ahead and do your nerve block. So practically, this is from the folks at Highland uh, EM uh, ultrasound. So compression of the air column by greater than 50% during injection. I think I said that backwards. So if you have more than 50%, if you compress a lot, it means you have a very high pressure. Um, so you don't wanna, you don't wanna do that. Um, I'm not, we're not doing this and I, I actually haven't seen this in practice, but I thought it was an interesting technique. So, I'm gonna move on to vascular injury. And there are blood vessels within the epineurium. And then there's also, of course, blood vessels within each of the fascicles. So little tiny blood vessels um, supplying the blood there. And then they cross out into the, they, they feed into or get fed from the um, blood vessels within the epineurium. So the different types of vascular injury you can have. You can have a, a hematoma formation. So actually, you know, outside the nerve that's squishing on the nerve. Um, and this is where you wanna use ultrasound so you make sure you're not puncturing a vessel to ca cause a hematoma um, outside of the nerve that's going to uh, compress it. But you can also have bleeding within a nerve sheath. So if you happen to stick your needle in there, um, and uh, especially if the patient is coagulopathic, you may actually have bleeding within the epineuron um, epineurium or within a, even within a fascicle that can cause um, damage. So you can also occlude the nerve blood supply. Most nerves have multiple sources of blood supply and the exception is the sciatic nerve. So it really only has one feeder blood vessel that, that supplies a whole lot of the nerve. Um, so um, you wanna be a little bit careful with the sciatic nerve. And some of your local anesthetics are actually vasoconstrictive. So if you inject intraneuronally, um, intraneuronally, yes, in the epineurium, uh, you can actually cause vasoconstriction of the, the blood vessels there. And if you're using epinephrine as an adjunct, that can actually make things worse. So consider your patient's risk um, for for having uh, vasoconstriction um, and whether you would want to use epinephrine because it might be great to keep your anesthetic in the right place, but it may also, um, it may also precipitate some vasoconstriction that can cut off, cut off the blood supply to your nerve, which might be a problem. You can also have chemical injury. And all local anesthetics are potentially toxic they can cause acute inflammation and they can cause chronic fibrosis um, because they're essentially a, a toxin um, to either the myelin or the actual components of the nerve cells. And they all have the potential to do this. So if you inject something intrafascicularly, you're more likely to have an injury because that's close to where the actual nerve cells are. Um, and just like with the pressure injury, with the mechanical injury, if you're intrafascicular, bad things will happen. So interestingly, if you are 
in a nerve that has a lot of the stroma, a lot of epineuria, then, and when you inject the medication, it seems to act as a protective um, measure. So if, if you put the medication in and you're pretty far away from the actual fascicles, there's far less likelihood that you're gonna get chemical damage. But, and that's kind of shown in the bottom picture. And in the upper picture, you can see that the, the, um, the ratio of fascicles to um, the epineurium is actually pretty high. Uh, so you might wanna think about um, you know, just being really careful that you're not in the nerve when you do these blocks. So infection can have a higher risk with catheters. Now, most of the time in the emergency department, we are not placing catheters. We're just doing a one-shot block. But if you happen to be putting in a catheter for a patient who is going um, somewhere, um, you should just know that people who are at higher risk are your ICU patients, if it's there for more than 48 hours. So this is something if you're turning over a catheter placed um, for, a, for regional anesthesia, you know, make sure that the team you're turning it over to knows how long it's been in there. And then axillary and femoral catheters. And they think this is because there's an increase of sebaceous uh, glands around there and that increases the likelihood of infection. For one-shot blocks, which we are typically doing, infection is pretty rare. Chlorhexidine is definitely the, the, um, the uh, uh, prep that you wanna use. It's been shown to be the most effective. And actually it's been shown that gowns really don't make a difference. And of course you're gonna use, um, you're gonna use your, your sterile um, gel and all of that good stuff. So this is an area they're really just starting to recognize that you can actually just cause inflammation by the block. And it might be, it might be the local anesthetic, anesthetic toxicity, um, but there may be some other mechanisms involved just from injecting something into the area around the nerves. Um, so that's not really well developed, but that's starting to be recognized as a separate entity that can cause uh, nerve nerve damage in blocks. So, <coughs> sorry, post-COVID. I wanna talk a little bit about some specific complications. So this is a diagram showing you the relationship of the brachial plexus, so those cervical nerve roots to the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve is the guy who really controls the uh, diaphragm. And there's a reasonably high incidence of causing phrenic nerve palsy, diaphragm paralyzation, by doing blocks. And in fact, with an interscaling block, they found that with a landmark technique and high volume, greater than 20 mLs, 100% of patients develop a transient phrenic nerve palsy. It's decreased by using ultrasound and by a lower volume. And it's decreased even further if you reduce the volume. But even then, it's only 27 to 45%. So this is likely to happen, particularly with an interscaling block, because you're hitting the um, nerve roots that actually um, can affect the diaphragm. Um, you're not down at C6 or C7, you're at five and sometimes above. Um, so, and with a smaller volume, you may not actually get an adequate block. So be aware of this phenomenon. And if you are thinking about doing a block that might uh, paralyze the diaphragm and your patient is already hypoxic, has pulmonary contusions, um, has bad COPD, you know, oxygen dependent, I would really think twice about using a block that might cause this. And these last from 0.02 to 1% are actually persistent. And that's where you get sued and pay out a half a million dollars. So the, the mechanism, it might be direct needle trauma. And this would be more likely if you're doing a landmark um, block rather than ultrasound guided. 
they have actually looked at the phrenic nerves and found inflammatory scarring. And whether that's from the local anesthetic toxicity or some other cause is really unclear. But this has been seen um, with, with, uh, um, with uh, the phrenic nerve when they've looked at it you know, on autopsy or typically a lot of this stuff is done in, um, in animal studies. So they, they specifically block nerves to, to see what happens and then they um, autopsy them. And, and uh, well, they also observe, observe the, the block, but then at autopsy, they can see what happened to the nerve itself. Um, and then there are risk factors for this that like pre-existing conditions. So spinal stenosis and nerve trauma. So the nerve trauma caused by, by um, us doing the block, but they already have underlying spinal stenosis. So their nerve roots may already be compromised. And if you add some pressure ischemia by putting in a high volume, um, of anesthetic, that's called the triple crush. And then you're even more likely to have a persistent um, nerve palsy. So what can you do to avoid this? Well, you can decrease the volume of the, of the local anesthetic in your interscaling block. Um, so you can actually perform the interscaling block a little more caught at, so down by the C7 root. You can do a supraclavicular block or a suprascapular block. Although those, particularly the suprascapular, if you're trying to block um, the shoulder, you'll probably need an axillary nerve block as well. So you think about other combinations and other nerve blocks that are lower down where you're less likely um, to get the, the, um, the phrenic nerve. Um, and have that palsy. So some considerations for people who may have trouble with even a transient nerve palsy. Um, do your blocks lower down. And I also wanna talk about, particularly with the interscaling block, but any blocks that involve the, the cervical nerve roots is that you can cause a Horner syndrome. So the, um, you can actually get the uh, sympathetic ganglia if the anesthetic crosses over and you can in the, the paravertebral, paravertebral space, and then you can actually get the Horner syndrome where you have ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of evidence for how long this lasts. It's, it's rarely persistent. In fact, I haven't found any, any study that looks at this, but there are some case reports of persistent Horner syndrome. Um, and then again, you can see it with other blocks of the roots. The other thing that you can see, particularly with an interscaling block is hoarseness um, because you catch the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And that happens to up to 20% of the people who we block and it's usually transient. So risk factors for nerve injury. So this is interesting. It's an area that's, that's pretty newly understudied and trying to figure out who is more likely to have complications from one of these blocks. And it turns out that people with neuropathies of almost any type are at higher risk for having a nerve injury and for having um, persistent uh, symptoms. So people with like central pain syndromes or central nerve issues, MS, post-stroke pain, spinal cord injuries, spinal stenosis, places those people at a higher risk for having nerve block complications. And then peripheral pain syndrome and metabolic neuropathies, diabetic polyneuropathy is actually strongly linked to having, um, to, having the, to increasing the likelihood of a peripheral nerve injury when you're doing a block. So really think about that in people with diabetic polyneuropathy. Um, and with any of these, you know, we want to actually do a good informed consent um, so that people understand that they may have some, some lingering effect, although most of them go away within a couple of months. Um, you know, very rarely they're, they're persistent. Um, so think about people who have pre-existing neuropathies, whether they're central or whether they're peripheral, um, because those folks are definitely at higher risk because they already have abnormal nerves. So what do we do? for a nerve injury. 
typically if someone has persistent pain, you know, or persistent numbness after a couple weeks, then, and you know, it's gotten better. It's not completely blocked. Typically these patients are monitored for at least a month unless it's getting worse. And of course, if it's not getting, if it's, if it's not um, improved after that, typically move on to nerve testing and then figure out the best management. Now, if it's getting worse, then you need to right away think about surgery um, and imaging. This is an algorithm from, um, from the Regional Anesthesia Society in uh, the UK. There's also, there's a similar one in the US, but I couldn't find a nice diagram of it. So basically an algorithm for managing these. So you have to suspect the nerve injury. So this would be somebody with a new onset pain, weakness, numbness, paresthesia after the nerve block and after the usual duration of the block. So it would be like greater than 48 hours after you do a peripheral nerve block. So somebody comes back to the ED a week later and they're still having numbness. Um, and you wanna, you know, of course, review everything. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you wanna give, do a good clinical exam, including uh, neurologic exam. And one of the things to consider is that a lot of these neuropathies, if this is someone who had surgery, so you blocked, you blocked an arm so that they would be more comfortable before they had their surgery and then they have persistent numbness, most of the time it's actually caused by something that happened in the surgery itself rather than the nerve block. Um, so that's something to consider. That's why you need to like have everybody involved. If you blocked them, did something in the ED um, that was non-surgical, it's more likely that it's, it's actually from the block. Um, and then of course, if there's, um, if there's a, uh, you think there's a space occupying lesion like a big hematoma, um, especially if it's a, with a neuroaxial block, so not a peripheral block, then you need to actually think about um, that it may have gone into the epidural space and then you need to take action. Um, so if you've reviewed everything and all they have is some numbness um, and it's getting better, basically you're gonna say, you know, most of the time these resolve and we send the patient home and review in about a month. If they still have symptoms, then you might want to consider a neurology referral. Um, and some, some um, societies recommend that you don't do any of this until two to three months. So the UK is, a, is fairly conservative. And after about four weeks, they recommend considering uh, imaging and considering neurologic um, referral. And then um, if there's a definitive diagnosis, you have to decide if uh, therapy is going to help, drugs, or maybe surgical intervention and then make sure that everybody who was involved in this surgery block is aware of what happened. If you have a really high degree of neurologic deficit, including a motor deficit, then you're going to really start thinking about is there, you know, was there a surgical cause? Um, and then if there's appropriate intervention and consider further imaging. Um, so immediate neurologic referral, nerve conduction tests, you might need to do an EMG, um, but the people who were doing a procedure, and this would be somebody that we blocked in the ED and then went on to have um, some type of surgery, and is it our block or is it actually something they injured in the surgery, which would be the more likely cause of this. Okay, at last, let's talk about last, local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So how often does it occur? Well, the current evidence is that it's really unlikely, 0.03% of peripheral blocks. However, if it happens, uh, if it's unrecognized and untreated, a bad things generally will happen to your patients and they will be wearing a toe tag. So who is most at risk? So high volume fascial blocks. So, you know, we're doing like a lot of serratus anterior blocks and um, fascia iliaca blocks, and those have a pretty high volume. So those folks have more of a risk for developing last. Continuous catheter techniques, again, not so applicable to the emergency department, but with anesthesia, or, you know, we may get to the point where we're placing catheters and, and they're, they're um, uh, maintaining them up on the floor. And those folks are at higher risk that you have to really calculate how much anesthetic they're getting. And then if there's multiple um, local anesthetic techniques in the same patient, 
So I know Kevin did um, some time with anesthesia and often the, the orthopedic surgeons would have put in a lot of, of local anesthetic while they were doing just, just before the surgery to numb the area up. So you have to take that into account when you actually go to do your block and make sure that you're not exceeding um, toxic doses. Um, and so same goes if we place a block in the ED, really important to, to document that a block was done and document how much of what was used so that the anesthesiologists upstairs will be aware of that if the patient needs to go to surgery. And then tumescent anesthesia. So if you put a bunch of um, anesthesia into the subcutaneous tissue and, and let it sit there, um, when it absorbs, uh, it seems to be more likely to cause last. And this is like the patients that you're doing liposuction on. So you put a whole bunch of anesthesia in there and for some reason you don't do the liposuction or you, you start and the patient doesn't like it. And now you have all this anesthesia that is stuck in the subcutaneous tissue in the fat. And as that resorbs, you um, may have a problem with it. So how do we get this? You can have direct vascular injection. So if you happen to uh, inject your local anesthetic into uh, a vein, um, this would be a big problem. And hopefully with ultrasound, that won't happen. But more likely is tissue absorption and then it gets into the systemic circulation. Um, so most of this stuff, the pharmacokinetics, most of the mass of this um, local anesthesia is going to wind up in your well-perfused tissue. So the heart and the brain receive a lot of it because they are well-perfused. So amino amide um, <clears throat> local anesthetics, which is most of what we use, bind to an alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, which is in turn metabolized in the liver by some of our favorite enzymes. So if your liver isn't working well, or you're on something that inhibits the CYP450 enzyme, you can actually wind up with toxicity of even a, a um, what would be considered a normal dose of the medication. So if somebody has liver disease or is on medication that, that changes the metabolism um, of the local anesthetics, something to really consider. So when does it occur? It's typically right after the block, but there are reports of this occurring out to several days after a single block. And then of course, later onset with infusion. There's one report of, of a um, last that, that uh, on, was, uh, had an onset of 11 days after, but this was with an infusion. So something to think about. That patient that you sign out an hour after you've signed them out, uh, if somebody doesn't know they had a nerve block and they decompensate, this would be a problem. So what do you see? Well, sometimes there's a prodrome where you get confusion and the patient will complain that their mouth is numb and they have tinnitus um, and they may be dizzy, they may be drowsy, they may have a bad taste, but you don't always get that. So a third of the people who present with this just present with CNS features to start with. So they don't have a prodrome, they just become agitated and become and have a seizure. Um, so no prodrome. And then a fifth present with isolated cardiovascular symptoms. So they don't have a seizure, they don't have any of this prodrome, but they start to have some conduction disturbances or they um, become bradycardic or they have um, ventricular badness, tachycardia, fibrillation. So just keep in mind that not everybody is going to have this nice prodrome where you can say, oh, gee, we need to stop the block. So um, this table, there's a lot here, but this is actually from, from uh, anesthesia, uh, the anesthesia journal in 2021. And they actually took a look at the risk factors and were able to, to come up with this table going from low risk to high risk, depending on whether you're using ultrasound, whether you're using low doses and less lipophilic and as local anesthetics. So um, the lower limbs, so a single shot um, or subcutaneous uh, infiltration in a lower limb, very low risk. Um, for pregnancy, no, comorbid no comorbid comorbidities, 
um, even people with hepatic disease or metabolic disease, um, the elderly are always going to be at, at more risk. And anybody with a low body mass, so if you have low body fat, you're going to be at higher risk because there's not as much fat for the, the uh, medication to go into. So it's going to wind up more in your brain and more in your cardiovascular system. And of course, extremes of age, neonates are also um, at higher risk. And people with cardiac disease, underlying cardiac disease, for all of these are at higher risk. But you can see if they have underlying cardiac disease, if you're doing you know, fascial plane blocks, intercostal blocks, um, intrapleural or paravertebral, um, you really wanna think about this in, in people who have um, <clears throat> like a low cardiac output state. So somebody with congestive heart failure, somebody who's got active ischemia, or pre-existing conduction um, issues. So something to think about. And then they have, so both for single shot and for catheter. And you'll notice that ultrasound makes a difference. Most people who are um, in the medium or high risk category for using no ultrasound are, are you know, more to the low, low to medium risk category. Um, but this is just a great table and it's, it's good to think about all of the underlying conditions that somebody has that may predispose them to uh, having last. So how do you prevent this? So one of the ways you can help prevent it is to use agents with a high cardiac collapse to CNS ratio, which means you have more, you're more likely to have CNS symptoms before you have cardiovascular collapse. So your patients seize before they go into cardiac arrest, and then you can identify it and start treating with, with uh, benzos, and hopefully you don't get um, to cardiovascular collapse. So benzos and then intralipids. Um, so ropivacaine uh, has a much higher cardiovascular collapse to CNS ratio than does bupivacaine. You can also use a larger dose of that. So just for your consideration. And then there's a levobupivacaine, which I uh, actually am not familiar with, but apparently it also has a higher um, cardiovascular collapse to CNS ratio. And then of course your risk assessment. So using something like that table above, is this patient at higher risk for, for, um, for developing last? Do I need to use less anesthesia? Uh, and in fact, in the elderly, they recommend 15 to 20% less local anesthetic for blocks because they're at higher risk. And of course, using ultrasound, as you saw on the table, is definitely um, going to help prevent it and adequate patient monitoring. You know, so we're, we're really busy. We have patients in the hall. So we're going to block this patient who's in the hall. Bad idea. So <laughs> you want to actually identify when things go bad. So they actually need to be on a monitor with a pulse ox um, and a cardiac monitor so you can see what's going on. And of course, don't exceed the recommended doses, right? So pupivacaine, two milligrams per kilogram. Um, lidocaine is five milligrams. And then of course, um, ropivacaine, which is what we're mostly using, uh, is three milligrams per kilogram. So you can actually um, use a higher, um, a higher, um, you can, you can use a higher ML of, of ropivacaine than bupivacaine. Um, and then of course, if you're adding epinephrine, you can even go higher than that. And epinephrine is something to think about. It does prevent the spread of blocks, but it may also be more likely to um, cause or to, um, to aggravate any vascular injury by causing vasoconstriction. So just to think about. And treating last, well, of course, the first thing is have a plan, right? This is not something you wanna say, oh yeah, we're gonna use intralipids if they develop last. You need to actually like know where they are, know the dosing, have a nice order set. Um, so so that's, that's the first thing. And, and of course, prevention is number one. So screen the patients. Make sure that you're using appropriate drug, appropriate dose, ultrasound, um, all the stuff that we just talked about. Uh, aspirate to, before injection so you're not in a vessel. And um, you can actually do fractionated dosing um, so that you're actually doing um, incremental dosing and you do it like greater than every 30 seconds so that you have um, 
you can recognize if they're developing symptoms of last um, and then stop, you know, you're not continuously infusing, so you can actually stop where you're at. And then awake patients, you know, you might detect it earlier than if they're anesthetized or unconscious and you're doing a block. Um, so a question for everyone, how accessible is your intralipid? Do you have an order set for it? Is it actually in your ED um, with clear instructions for the nurses? Um, so make sure you have a plan. And then detections, uh, of course, the signs, CNS signs, um, hopefully you're using an agent, <laughs> sorry, an agent that is uh, going to cause CNS effects before cardiovascular. So um, they may have some, some uh, uh, non-specific prodrome, um, but then they may also come up with agitation, confusion, seizures. So recognizing that and then recognizing the cardiovascular signs. And again, these can prevent, present in isolation. So you can have um, you know, a hyperdynamic heart where you become hypertensive and tacky, uh, but more likely you're going to see hypotension, bradycardia, a block, some type of ventricular arrhythmia, and then you go into asystole. So what do we do? Well, we stop injecting the local anesthetic. Uh, you get your last, your last kit. Um, of course, you're gonna take care of the airway like we always do. Um, and then if somebody is seizing, you are going to give them benzos. Um, so you can consider small doses of propofol or thiopentine, but um, you, the mainstay of treatment is benzos. And then if they're seizing and, and last is in your differential, go ahead and um, think and maybe just give uh, lipid emulsion. So, uh, and then thinking about where it might go. So these patients occasionally require cardiopulmonary bypass um, with ECMO. So that's something that you might think about is, do I have a place to transport this patient to if I need to? Um, although you may not, they may not last long enough to do that. So cardiac arrhythmias, it's kind of like ACLS, except you want to use less epinephrine. Um, so they want you to do it after you get the lipid therapy and less epinephrine because it may um, cause uh, increased cardiovascular effects. And then you want to avoid anything that's going to cause a block, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, anything that's a sodium channel blocker. So like probably don't give lidocaine. Um, and then consider ECMO if you're not able to resuscitate them. The lipid emulsion therapy, it's typically a bolus of 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Although for patients who are 70 kilograms or over, you can just give 100 mLs. So if they're under 70 kilograms, then it's recommended that you actually calculate the dose. And then you're going to go ahead and do a continuous infusion um, until the patient is stable for about 10 minutes. Um, and then if they continue to be unstable or they get worse, you can actually repeat the same bolus and double the infusion um, rate. So the maximum dose is approximately 10 mLs per kilogram or 700 mLs. So there's not just a lot of um, great evidence on that, but um, that's the recommended maximum dose. And then of course, um, transferring to the appropriate place, at least six hours. Um, and so, you know, monitoring people after a block, if they have symptoms that might suggest like they had perioral numbness, nothing else, you should still monitor them for about six hours. Obviously, if they actually develop full blown last, you're going to admit them for a bit longer. Um, and then, you know, this clinical review to exclude pancreatitis, I'm not really sure where that came from. And then of course they want you to uh, report any cases and the use of lipid emulsion therapy to lipidrescue.org. So I have a plan. So peripheral nerve complications. We talked about the multiple mechanisms of injury. We talked about some strategies to minimize the injuries. And we talked about the risk factors for last and you know the thought that you need to have a plan, prepare for last with every block recognize the presentation, keeping in mind that some patients will present with CNS symptoms. 
um, without any prodrome, and some patients will go straight to cardiovascular um, symptoms and signs. So that's a problem. And then we talked about how to treat last. And that's all I have.